Hello, my name is Matthew Whittall. I'm here representing NASA's Kennedy Space Center Granular Mechanics and Regolith Operations Laboratory, as well as Deep Space Logistics for the Gateway. The title of this work is The Behavior of High Velocity Dust Generated by Lander Plumes in the Lunar Environment. This work has been completed in association with several individuals, namely Jim Montavani and Jay Phillips at NASA's Kennedy Space Center, Phil Metzger at the University of Central Florida, and Bruce Link and Dan Bacheldor at Southeastern University's Research Association. Lunar lander plumes have been known to accelerate fine dust to extremely high velocities, that is, velocities exceeding 2 kilometers per second. And the resultant ejecta may remain in lunar orbit for quite some time. Such ejecta may pose hazards to objects in lunar orbit or even uh, assets on the surface when it re-impacts. In order to understand the impact that this dust may have on assets in lunar orbit, such as the gateway, or things on the surface, such as the lunar base, this work considers the dynamics of the resultant high velocity ejecta from that lander plume. Initial conditions were set by the expected near-term lunar activity and the known cone of accelerated uh, material generated by the lander plume. The effects of the three-body problem, as well as things like the solar radiation pressure, electric magnetic fields, are all included in the model. Let's go over a little bit of background. Over billions of years, the bombardment and spallation of the meteorites on the lunar surface have created a surface of fine regolith that coats the entire lunar surface. This is known as impact gardening and has resulted in a size distribution between uh, 70 micrometers and goes down to the sub-micron scale. In addition to this, observations have been made uh, of a fine cloud of dust near the lunar surface that scatters sunlight. It's interacting with the electric fields on the lunar surface. Uh, and of course, data has been collected uh, from impacts on the lunar surface as well. Uh, since the Apollo era, concern has been circulating about the impact that this fine dust might have on uh, spacecraft functionality, astronaut health, and general mission success. Uh, with the start of the Artemis program, uh, the background of concerned whispers have kind of become more prominent voices and has received attention and more importantly funding. However, little attention has been paid to the high velocity dust that's at near the escape velocity that is generated from these landings on the surface. Uh, the lifetimes of this kind of escape velocity domain or EVD ejecta can last up to 10 years or maybe even longer uh, depending on the initial trajectory and the amount of energy that that particle has. However, the lifetime and impact of this fine dust, especially within this escape velocity domain, is very poorly understood. Uh, and so the focus of this research is to take a look at that high velocity dust. It's worth noting that in multi-body systems where the masses of two objects are comparable, such as the Earth and Moon or Pluto Charon, uh, the escape velocity at any one of these objects usually isn't just a single value. Uh, and determining where any given particle goes when it leaves the surface at the escape velocity is non-trivial. Simple preliminary studies on this high velocity plume ejecta have raised concerns that the landers could bombard the surface or interfere with gateway operations uh, simply due to how fast it's leaving. Uh, to approximate the amount of dust that can be ejected, we introduce a number of approximations based on empirical data, mostly from Apollo. First, observational data from Apollo has produced the following approximation for ejected mass as a function of lander mass, where M lander is in metric tons. This formula may provide total ejected mass, but it doesn't really describe the velocity distribution associated with that mass. Uh, indeed, this is kind of a non-trivial approximation by itself, uh, and there are competing methodologies about how to approximate it. For this model, we will use the simplified ejecta velocity distribution generated by Hausen and Holzapple, which I included in my previous work. Uh, now, this is designed for impactors and not necessarily for plume ejecta, and those are two different physical phenomena. However, because there is no uh, easy approximation for this high velocity dust, we're going to use just the just the velocity distribution model from this and remove kind of the impactor portion. So normalize the impactor and plug in that formula for total ejected mass, to try and get an idea of this velocity distribution. Now there's a couple of parameters you might notice in here, the nu and the mu, that where the nu is the mass density value and mu is the material dimension exponent. In this simulation, lunar dust is approximated as weakly cemented basalt. So the values of those two are 0.4 and 0.55 respectively. If we replace the scaling coefficient c with the ejecta mass formula we mentioned before, we can kind of get a rough estimate of what kind of mass we should expect given velocity. The next piece of the puzzle is the particle size distribution for this high velocity dust. Now, intuitively, we know that only the smaller particles will reach this high velocity. 
uh, and this is represented in the following equation, where n tilde is the normalization factor shown here and r is the particle size. For any given r, we can approximate the percentage of any given particle size to be found uh, and scale that based on the total expected mass to be found at a given velocity to determine the number of those particles, the counts. So talking now about the space environment, in addition to SRP, there are a number of other non-gravitational forces that we should probably consider in order to get an accurate idea of, of what the, these particles will do, how they behave. Now keep in mind, a lot of these forces really aren't significant for larger spacecraft. They're only really significant for these tiny, tiny dust pieces. Uh, for example, on the day side of the moon, it is bombarded with X-ray and UV photons, while the night side interacts with the lunar wake. The Earth-Moon system is embedded within an interplanetary magnetic field generated by the sun, and of course the solar wind, which is ever present. In addition, the moon spends about 25% of its time uh, within the main needle tail of Earth. So that's gonna add a little bit more dynamism into the equation. It's a little bit different when you get close to the surface of the moon. There's a, a charge that exists and varies depending on where you're located. And it's especially volatile and dynamic near the, uh, the Terminator. Now, at the Lunar South Pole, where there's expected to be landings for the Artemis program, this can vary tremendously because it's constantly in the, in the Terminator and you have a lot of long shadows that are moving around pretty regularly. So calculating the electric field at any given point is very much non-trivial. It's kind of uh, difficult to do. So we're gonna have to make some assumptions. Away from the surface, the electromagnetic environment is dominated by the solar wind, but there are other features and other effects going in, such as the Earth's magneto tail, and direct measurements over the past 30 years show an average magneto tail strength of about 6 nanotesla, and a proton density of 6.7 cubic centimeters, a plasma speed of 430 kilometers a second, and an electric field strength of 0 0.017 millivolts per meter. And finally, a solar flux of 1.1 times 10 to the negative 20th watts meter squared per hertz, as extracted from NASA Goddard's Omni dataset. Now, these dynamics are complicated, but by examining dominant forces and making some assumptions, they can kind of be narrowed down to a manageable level. Uh, for example, the moon's surface is taken to be featureless. There's no cratering or hills or valleys or anything to obstruct the light. So you're either in light or you're not. So that kind of takes care of some of the complications down there. The in-space dynamics are dominated by the electric field, uh, solar radiation pressure, and the Earth's magneto tail, which are all included in the model. Um, these become more dominant for smaller particles, which have a mass to cross-sectional area relationship of one over R. Thus, as R approaches zero, the cross-sectional area becomes more and more dominant. Based on previous work by Lane and Metzger, several estimates exist based on data obtained by uh, Apollo on the size distribution total mass, and some of those we already went over before. Charge on each particle is a function of cross-sectional area, which can be obtained explicitly through particle size and making the approximation that they are spheres. A conservative estimate on the charge of these particles is about 1.1 microcoulomb per square meter. Finally, the initial state of each particle, uh, based again on Apollo data, is between one and three degrees from the surface and 100, 360 degrees around. And the velocity has been constrained uh, to a minimum of 1.5 kilometers per second and a maximum of about 2.7 kilometers per second. So the simulation was performed using the Free Flyer software, which if you're not familiar with it, is a, a powerful numerical integration tool and has the capability of modeling things as formation and integrating them together. So a lot of these simulations had about 5,000 members of these formations, which were just the dust particles. Uh, as one might expect, the smaller the particle size, the more influence the solar wind had over them because of the aforementioned uh, relationship between cross-sectional area and mass. So as we decreased the, the particle size, the fewer and fewer of them were left in orbit long enough to re-impact the surface, as can be seen by this plot. Using the formulae uh, defined earlier in this presentation, we can estimate that about 99%, the vast majority of these particles are uh, 10 micrometers or smaller. Now of that, well, about 90% of it is carried away from the moon's gravity well by uh, electrical influences or the solar wind before it has a chance to do any harm. So after seven days, only about 11.2% of this dust remains uh, in the lunar gravity well. And of that, the vast majority has re-impacted the surface, about 90%. Now using the mass velocity relationship defined earlier, uh, and assuming a uniform density of about 1500 kilograms per cubic meter, it is estimated that for a 10 kilogram lander, approximately uh, 47,710 micrometer dust particles will re-impact the surface uh, over the course of seven days. Uh, for a 40 ton lander, such as what is expected for Artemis, that goes up to 108,000 particles. 
So next we must determine where these particles re-impact. Uh, the South Pole landing site is located at the center of this figure. Although the mean impact site is the same across the velocity spectrum, we can see that the medium distance increases with respect to velocity. So what is the likelihood that a surface structure would experience a bombardment of dust due to a lunar landing, and how many impacts would it expect to see from any given landing? Well, that depends on two key factors. One is the size of the lander, and two is how far away you are from the landing site. For an exposed base occupying one square kilometer, located one kilometer away, it may expect as many as eight impacts from a ton-ton lander, uh, each impact carrying about 23.5 joules of energy. At five kilometers, that drops off to a 37% chance of impact, and at 10 kilometers, it's a 10% chance. If the lander size is increased to an Artemis-sized 40-ton lander, then the chance of impact at 1, 5, and 10 kilometers away from the landing site, respectively, is 1,800%, uh, 84%, and 22%. Yeah, by testing out a variety of landing sizes, we can kind of derive this curve and we can fit it. And uh, we derive this formula that represents the likelihood of impact based on lander size and distance from landing site. Now regarding the lunar gateway, uh, of the roughly 9.5% of particles that remain in orbit after seven days uh, between the velocities 1.7 and 2.3 kilometers per second, none were simulated to impact the gateway or cross its 100 kilometer uh, sphere of influence. By determining the eccentricity and velocity of these initial trajectories uh, and get the energy of those orbits, we can kind of constrain the amount of volume that these particles will occupy. Since Kepler's second law states that a particle in orbit will sweep out equal area in equal time, and because the integration time is so long and the range of velocities is so great, we can assume that the orbiting particles uh, get distributed over various orbits uh, during the time it takes for the gateway to pass by one orbit. So assuming that there is a uniform distribution of the estimated 6,500 particles occupying uh, an estimated 3.6 times 10 to the 11th uh, cubic kilometers, this results in an estimated 1.8 times 10 to the negative eight particles per cubic kilometer. Now other orbits with shorter periods may be at higher risk, uh, but further analysis would be needed to quantify what that risk is, and it depends on the orbit, of course. So in conclusion, and based on previous estimates and experimental data, uh, this work has simulated the trajectories of many, many particles between the range of 10 micrometers and about 0.01 meters, or one centimeter, uh, generated by lander plumes near the South Pole at a velocity range between 1.5 and 2.7 kilometers per second to determine the possible impact to surface infrastructure and orbiting infrastructure. Uh, by including simplified models of the electrical and magnetic fields uh, near the lunar surface and in the lunar environment, uh, it is shown that particles much smaller than 10 micrometers are carried away by the solar wind. Uh, however, uh, the amount of regolith and dust that remains in the gravity well of the lunar surface uh, is 12% of the total ejected mass in this velocity range. And of that, about 90% re-impacts the surface. So concerns about the impact that this dust may have on the lunar surface has been justified, and further consideration should probably be given to the construction of landing pads on the moon to mitigate the spread of this dust. However, concerns by the authors, including myself, uh, regarding the safety of the Deep Space Gateway and other things in orbit have been shown to be unwarranted. There's a very low amount of fine debris that remains in orbit by the time the Gateway completes one orbit, about 6.5 days. Uh, and the total particle density uh, in that area it's been calculated to be about 1.8 times 10 to the negative eight uh, particles per cubic kilometer. Uh, these are empirical preliminary results based off of an ongoing effort to try and assess and quantify uh, all of the things that are going on in the lunar environment. Uh, so this is definitely not intended to be the final word in the project, far from it. This is just kind of a first pass, a general understanding of what's going on. Uh, the immediate focus of future work is to uh, refine our understanding of the initial conditions of these particles to get a better understanding of what velocity range they're really going at, get a more accurate assessment of the mass distribution, uh, and to understand better the charged environment near the surface, near the South Pole. And finally, we could uh, integrate this with a very high fidelity CFD simulation to refine the initial velocities and trajectories and get a better understanding of the behavior of these fine particles and their impact uh, in both in space and on the surface uh, to better characterize the risks to future missions. So a uh, special thanks to Ben Asher of AI Solutions for helping me work through the free flyer part of this and Adrian Dove of the University of Central Florida for helping to characterize the charged environment uh, near the moon.
So thank you for coming to my talk. I have another presentation on a novel control and uh, stochastic estimation formulation for SA3. Uh, the Q&A session for that is on Monday. Thank you very much.